Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bex Hayho, the Executive Director of United to End Homelessness with Orange County United Way. Last month during our community chat, we had a Q&A session with Elizabeth Andrade from Family Assistance Ministries and Carrie Buck from his OC. If you missed it, you can check out the recording of that chat on YouTube or Facebook. For this month's community chat, I'm really excited to welcome some good friends of mine for a robust discussion on a really important topic that gets uh, discussed quite a bit, but today we are gonna dive into it in a lot more detail. So we've wanted to cover this chat for a while. We're gonna unpack it. We're gonna talk about the narrative of service resistance and what's going on here in our community. So to help us unpack this topic, we are really excited to welcome Tim Houchin, the chair of the Orange County Continuum of Care Lived Experience Advisory Committee, a member of the COC board, Dr. Shantina Sorrells, chief program officer for the Orangewood Foundation, also a member of the COC board. I just realized that we have four members of the COC board here today, and Matt Bates, the vice president of CityNet, who is the secretary of our local Continuum of Care board. Today, we are all here speaking on behalf of our organizations and sharing the expertise that we've learned over the years. So before we dive in, I would love for each of you to just take a moment to introduce yourself and kind of share your vantage point um, as to why you're a part of today's panel talking about service resistance. And Matt, I'll come to you first. Well, thanks so much. And thanks, first of all, for having me. Um, I'm honored to be on this panel with the other panelists. I'm eager to hear from them and to learn along with everyone else. Um, I think I'm here because uh, sitting as an agency, we're engaged in a lot of street outreach and engagement. And so this question comes up to us a lot from many different angles, um, not only in Orange County, but across five Southern California counties and maybe more than 40 cities, something like that. Um, we're working day in, day out. Um, with unsheltered homeless neighbors who are living um, in the streets trying to connect them to services. And so um, this question about connecting individuals to services is one that uh, we deal with quite a lot. And um, like I said, I'm, I'm eager to hear what the others have to say as well. Thank you so much, Matt. Tim. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Tim Houchin. Uh, uh, formerly homeless, uh, having experienced uh, brief and intermittent episodes of homelessness uh, between 2006 and 2010, and chronic homelessness between 2010 and 2015. Uh, and during that time, I lived at the Civic Center in uh, Santa Ana. Uh, I am, um, as was said, I, I'm a chairman of the Lived Experience Advisory Committee for the COC, uh, and um, I also have been organizer of events um, in recognition of Homeless Persons Memorial Day held each year on December 21st since 2014. Thank you so much, Dr. Sorrells. Good morning, I am here as representative of Orangewood Foundation. And one of our key components of the services we provide is for youth who are experiencing homelessness ages 16 to 24. And we have been doing that for a long time. And while we started with really looking at youth who have exited the foster care system, we have since expanded um, in the last several years because we really see that not all youth become system involved. And so they may also experience homelessness outside of that. In fact, many of them do. And so our services are really centered in that. I also have personal experience having exited the foster care system um, at 18 with skit and experiencing homelessness myself, and then also as a child. So that is my experience and why I'm here and what I hope to share with you all today. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to have the different vantage points that you all bring um, come into this discussion. So service resistance, uh, this term can be a bit of a hot topic, um, a hot button topic, um, not here just in Orange County, California, but across the country and across the globe. We actually had some questions that came in today from my home, which is the UK. Um, so we know that this is something that people have got strong thoughts on, strong opinions on, and we know that it's also something that people have a lot of questions about. So before we dive into our discussion, I thought it would be really helpful 
to just kind of put out there and see if, if the four of us can agree on kind of what we mean by service resistance and what we hear from people out in the community when this term is used. So from what I've seen, the people that are using the term service resistance are most often using it to refer to situations where people who are currently experiencing homelessness, and most, uh, most normally they're referring to people who are unsheltered, um, who for whatever the reason may be, seem to not be consistently engaging in opportunities or services that are being presented to them by another person. And that person could be an outreach worker, a passerby, a volunteer, a social worker, a police officer. Um, so before we move any further, would you all, are you all comfortable with us using that as the definition of service resistance? I'm seeing people nodding. Yes. Matt yes. said yes. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. For the record for our community chat, everybody nodded and said yes. <laughs> Okay, perfect. So now that we've got our common definition, let's start digging in. We had, as I mentioned, some really great uh, questions that came in from all over the place. And I'm going to read this one question word for word because I think there's a lot going on here for us to unpack. So the question that came in was, how do you draw the line between service resistance and someone not liking the available resources. So Matt, I'm going to come to you first for this one. Thank you, and I agree it's a great question. Um, and I, I just have to say, I'm gonna approach this from the response of a service provider. And, and I know that there's some other questions later on from different perspectives on this topic of service resistance, but as a service provider, CityNet, I think, joins most service providers in that we don't use that term. We don't have a category of individuals that we consider to be service resistant. Um, and the reason is because we uh, believe that context matters in this. So it, the who, what, where, when, why, how, who, who's offering, what's being offered, when it's being offered, where, um, how, all that, that matters in connecting people to resources. And I liken it to... Um, the analogy that if if you asked me to go to dinner and I were to say, no, um, I, I don't want to go to dinner, that doesn't make me dinner resistant. Uh, in fact, um, I am dinner positive. I love dinner and I have dinner every night, but I might not go to dinner with you because of the context, right? I may not want to go to the restaurant that you're wanting to go to. I may not uh, have the money to afford it. I may have had a bad experience at that restaurant. I may uh, have already just eaten, and so I'm not hungry right now. Uh, I may want to go with you on another night, another day of the week, another week, um, and if you were to ask again at another time, I would say yes, but just because I say no, I, I you know, I, I, I don't want to go to dinner with you tonight, that doesn't mean that I'm, uh, th that I'm resistive to, to that experience. So I, um, you know, we, we think of that when we are engaging with homeless neighbors that um, if there are barriers and if there is resistance, we try to consider the context and to see if it's a question of who, what, where, when, why, how. Um, and then we just, keep, we just keep asking because experience has taught us that um, today's you know, no, maybe tomorrow's yes. And we just want to form strong, trusting relationships so that when people um, are ready to, to to accept whatever service is available, um, that they can reach out to us and we can make that connection for them. That's a great way to kick us off. Thank you, Matt. And one thing that I really took away from there that I just want to kind of re-echo re is what you said about the fact that service providers don't tend to use the terminology service resistant. And so I think that's a really important takeaway that I just wanted to kind of pull out, highlight and underline. Um, and so now that I've done that, Tim, I'd like to come to you. Thanks, Bex. Yes, people are drawing the line on the issue of service resistance among persons experiencing homelessness, along with another term, sometimes used in a negative sense, shelter resistance, uh, which wrongfully sometimes creates the perception that homeless persons would rather choose not to have a roof over their head than accept staying in a homeless shelter 
based on frivolous preference. Both terms perhaps imply that severe mental illness is somehow involved in making these choices. This is not necessarily true according to some mental health experts who are studying how stress and trauma are playing a critical role in the decisions made by homeless persons to shelter or not. Persons experiencing homelessness are constantly under stress to determine healthy, safe, and secure places to sleep at night, as well as where and when their next decent meal will come from. They experience stress while trying to manage and secure their few personal possessions from frequent and random theft from other homeless persons or confiscation by law enforcement. The events experienced prior to becoming homeless are often, often traumatizing. Loss of employment, eviction, separation from loved ones, isolation, etc. Once becoming homeless, a, a person may be further traumatized by neglect, psychological, physical, or sexual abuse, or exposure to extreme violence to oneself or others. Chronic homelessness is chronic exposure to stress and chronic exposure to trauma that could lead to post-traumatic stress disorder, says the National Health Care for the Homeless Council. But not all homeless systems are trauma-informed enough to identify PTSD in their homeless clients and consumers. Today's conventional homeless shelters may be considered may not be considered as suitable for persons affected by stress and trauma, and therefore they may choose not to live in an open warehouse type setting with little privacy and little room for movement. They may have concerns for personal safety once inside the shelter, fearing violence upon themselves or other shelter residents. Conventional shelters may make them feel vulnerable to confrontation and verbal or physical abuse from other shelter residents, and in some cases, members of shelter staff. They may feel uncomfortable leaving personal possessions behind upon leaving the shelter during the day, fearing that possessions might be stolen or thrown away. Unsanitary conditions are common in conventional shelters and may provoke fear of other people's infectious diseases. This was a fear that was made real during the recent pandemic when nearly every homeless shelter in Orange County experienced widespread outbreaks of coronavirus. If we are going to draw a line on service or shelter resistance, then we should do so by eliminating many of the reasons why persons experiencing homelessness are choosing to live on the streets rather than in conventional shelters. Standards of trauma-informed care need to be implemented in the design of shelter facilities in addition to the service and care that we are providing uh, offered and being offered at these facilities. Thank you so much, Tim. There are a couple of things that you mentioned that I kind of want to want to pull out. One is the trauma related, and we're going to have another question on that shortly. And so just for anybody watching, we are going to dig into the impacts of trauma in a moment. And then the other part that you mentioned, Tim, just about kind of shelters and why people uh, thank you first for your insights and helping us understand that in a much better way. And it, what it really kind of drew out for me was the idea of are the services that we're offering actually meeting the needs of the people who we're trying to help? And so when we're trying to offer something that may not actually meet the real needs, then of course people may not say yes or may not want to accept something that's not meeting their real needs. And so that I think was something really important for us to remember as a system is making sure that we are providing services that meet real needs and doing that in a way that is trauma informed and following best practices. So thank you so much, Tim, for bringing those pieces out and highlighting them for our discussion today. And so Dr. Sorrells, I'm gonna to come to you now um, to close us out for this first big question. Absolutely, and I would echo both of what my colleagues have said, but really thinking from the transitional age youth perspective or that 16 to 24, you have a couple of other factors to really factor in. When you look at primarily who are in the different services, you typically either have very child-focused services or adult-focused services. And very few services are out there are really tailored to the 16 to 24 population. 
And to be very honest, it's very different being a 16 to 24 year old. If you can remember any of us, it's a very different time frame. It's a different way of thinking because one, adolescent brain development, adolescent brains are on a whole different trajectory than when they are once we're post 25. And so really thinking about that decision making and the thought process, it definitely ties into a lot of what Tim said but also even more where they are very socially motivated. They are looking at a lens that is different. Our society has also deemed that these youth have more opportunity and they should just get out there, go to college, get a job and do their thing. And so the utilization of a service almost seems like that's not made for them. It's not something that they should actually take advantage of. They should leave it for someone else. It should be something that someone else utilizes. And so that's a real challenge when we're talking about transitional age youth and the way they view the services. In addition, the other thing is, do they see themselves in our messages? Are we messaging to them? How many of us are using TikTok or Instagram or different ways to talk about our services? Transitional youth aren't usually walking around with full page flyers. They're not usually walking around and they're also not usually experiencing unsheltered by being on the street somewhere. They're typically couch surfing. They're typically, you know, doing different ways of surviving. And so that looks very different. And so if we don't actually tailor our messages to reach a population that may not look like the rest of our population, then we're not gonna reach them. They're not gonna see themselves. And they're not going to see that they can actually utilize some of the services that we have available. And last but not least is really thinking about how we deliver services. When you're talking about that adolescent brain development, we can't teach, you know, we can't treat them like children, but we also have to understand that their decision making and where they're at is not quite at the well-versed adult side. And so we have to really walk them through things. We can't hand them a list of resources and expect them to carry it out. We can't assume that they know how to fill out an application. So there's a lot of different things where we have to take a step back and really ask them and explore what they need so we can actually meet their services where they are at and make sure that it's a part of what they need to get done. Thank you so much. And I, I think what you said just kind of built on what we had heard from both Tim and Matt. And so it's, it's interesting to hear three different perspectives, three different areas of expertise, but all saying very similar things around, you know, what are, <laughs> I love what Matt was saying about he's not dinner resistant, um, but it depends. What is the dinner? Is he hungry? Has he eaten? Has he not? And that just kind of really reinforces what I was hearing from everybody, which are, are the services that we have in the system appropriate to the needs of people in our community? And how do we communicate about those services? How are they being offered? Um, how are people being engaged? And so a lot, a lot for us uh, to, to be thinking about. And so I wanna come back now to what Tim was talking about when it comes to trauma. And so Dr. Sorrell, I'm gonna ask you um, to talk kind of uh, more deeply into this um, and, and talk about kind of what could be going on in somebody's brain. What might be happening um, when somebody is being potentially offered services but they've experienced significant trauma in their life? I'd love to hear from you. Absolutely, and I'll reiterate actually quite of the main points that Tim made, which were fantastic. Um, to summarize them, we call those trauma triggers. And so basically when something really, really dangerous or life-threatening or just really scary happens, we all incur trauma. We have all been in a car accident or something where we fell and maybe we were really scared in that moment, that's trauma. But then when you take that and you compound it, it becomes what we call complex trauma. Um, and it happens over time. And so when you have that complex trauma, multiple experiences of danger, multiple experiences of safety, then you tend to, your brain tends to relate all new situations as dangerous. Anything that comes into play that is something you're not familiar with could be potentially dangerous. We call it hyperarousal, hypervigilance, hyperawareness, something in that category, but it really is about seeing things that you don't know or understand as something that could harm you potentially. And our brain does that automatically. It's not a conscious thinking. It's not something that you're going, oh, I see this, I see this, I do it. Our brain jumps there after we've had so many experiences that can leave us in a stage of flight, flight, or freeze, um, or fawning. That's the other one that we like to throw out there as well. The other thing is avoidance and numbing. So this can also come into play when not wanting to be 
not wanting to have to face your past traumas, because a lot of times to receive services and move forward, you have to tell them why you're experiencing homelessness. You have to tell them what's going on. You have to tell them in your life what's what's happening so that you can get help. But a lot of people aren't ready and it may be actually psychological damaging to start there for them. And so they often don't want to jump into that pool of their past and the hurts and the things that have happened just to receive services. And so that's an ad additional challenge. And the last but not least is one thing we call invisible suitcase. And this is all of the experiences that they have collected over their lives and how they view themselves. And it starts to become a self image and a self belief about yourself that you are not deserving or you are not worthy or this is something that you could never achieve and so you can sometimes shut down about what is actually available to you and so that can come into play um, additionally and all of this is stored in the brain and it's all something that your brain does to protect you but unfortunately to those of us who are providing services it can really look like maybe they don't want something or they don't like something but a lot of times it's their brain protecting them from the past hurts and traumas that they've experienced. And the last thing I will add, I was just thinking about it, is the chosen family. So when you've built a network, you've built a safe place, at least with people that you trust, to be removed from that. Most people who have been system involved, incarcerated, or foster care do not want to be removed from a chosen family or people that they have picked to be in their lives and place somewhere where they don't know anyone, because that is something that they've experienced. Thank you so much. That was a lot of information in a really short space of time. So thank you for packing that in there. Uh, Tim, I'm going to come back to you. Anything that you'd like to add to this from your perspective? Oh, Tim, we can't hear you. I said, no, I don't really have anything to add because I couldn't have put it in, in any better words than that. I Perfect. Well, thank you, Tim. Um, I do want to just put out a couple of book recommendations. If anybody was kind of really intrigued about this topic and the impact of trauma, two books that I would recommend. One is What Happened to You. Uh, it's a conversation between Oprah and um, a doctor whose name I can't remember, but there's Oh, sorry. Say that again. Bruce, Bruce Perry. Thank you. <laughs> and the link is popping in the chat box here. That is a, a really kind of, it's an easy read to discussing trauma, really, really helpful. And then also the body keeps score. Um, that read is a bit more technical, but if you love science and kind of really understanding what's happening with the, the parasympathetic nervous system and trauma and the impacts of that and how to kind of, in some ways, reverse the impacts of trauma would highly recommend both of those books. Um, really, really useful tools in our general life. And then also if you're interested in how to provide trauma-informed care as well, really great books. But moving on from that, we did have a number of questions that came in around the role of police departments when it comes to engaging with members of the community who are without a home. And we heard from a number of people that where they most often hear the term service resistant is being used by law enforcement. And so Matt, I'm gonna pivot this one over to you and ask if you'd like to speak on this one a little bit more. Sure, and here's where, um, you know, I think I, we have to acknowledge that, you know, we are service providers, but that service providers are just one of the categories of stakeholders that have to do with homelessness in the community. So um, for law enforcement and for maybe city, city staff or city departments or, um, county staff, county departments, sometimes they think of service resistance because the, the reason that they, they're kind of required to think of it because in Orange County and in, in most counties in Southern California, in fact, most states in the West, um, there's the reality that um, one, from a legal standpoint, it's not illegal to be homeless, but two, if there are ordinances like no camping ordinances or anti-loitering ordinances and local municipalities want to be able to enforce those ordinances, then they're required by law to offer services. And so then the question comes up, well, how often do I as a city have to offer services to someone who's homeless in one of our parks uh, before I can you know, enforce the anti-camping ordinance in the park? And of course, the, the interest there, um, whether that's law enforcement or city staff, is, is that parks are 
meant to be for the entire population and not just one, one part of the population. So we have these public spaces that have intended uses and it's, it's the responsibility of law enforcement and the cities that deploy them to ensure that these public spaces are available for their intended uses. And so as agencies, we acknowledge, you know, as a street outreach agency, we acknowledge the negative impacts that can accrue from uh, on, on neighborhoods, on businesses, on property owners, on homeowners um, from homelessness and, and large homeless encampments in particular. So the bind there is how do we determine um, you know, when we can enforce the applicable laws and when can't we? And I'm, again, I'm not law enforcement, but I'm, I'm reflecting on dozens of conversations that I've had with law enforcement and recognize that, that challenge. Um, again, as service providers, you know, we don't have that category and we offer services. Um, but I think there's a real, we, we just, as service providers, we also have to be uh, cognizant that there is, a, there is an important uh, question that faces the broader community which is that, you know, at what point can, can um, we as the community intervene and, um, and enforce laws that are in place, recognizing that it's not illegal to be homeless and therefore, um, you know, people that are, that are homeless need to have places where they can perform their activities of daily living, where they can store their properties, where they can shower, where they can go to the restroom, where they can eat, uh, where they can sleep. And all of these things cannot be illegal and they cannot all be uh, they can't be on private property, so all public public uh, property can't can't be restrictive of those uses. So I think all that just speaks to um, the broader kind of community dialogue around homelessness. And I think it comes up this issue of service resistance comes up because communities having that interest one in providing care for homeless neighbors, but also in um, having public spaces that are restored to their intended uses. Thank you so much, Matt. And time is, is marching on very, very quickly. So I'm gonna move us on to, to the next question. Um, so another really important part of this discussion is about recognizing and focusing in on BIPOC and L LGBTQ+, on their specific experiences with services and systems historically and currently. And I would love it, and unfortunately we only have time for one person to jump in here, but I would love it if one of you could jump in and talk about how these experiences connect and relate to the discussion we're having around service resistance. Jump in here. Um, so one of the things that we really have to think about when you're talking about marginalized groups or oppressed groups is typically their service utilization is lower in general because of the systemic racism and the systemic homophobia and the sy systemic issues, isms that are throughout all of our systems. And so many times people who are from marginalized communities are less likely to use a service in general because they are fearful, um, because they feel like it may lead to other harmful outcomes such as incarceration or hospitalization and so on and so forth. And so when we think about our systems and these communities, the likelihood of them utilizing them has been lower because we haven't really been thoughtful about understanding some of those um, crossroads of, of what's happening with the different marginalized communities and how to best ensure that our services are respectful and understanding of their experiences, what they've been through when you've been oppressed for many years and many times you may resist in a different way. You may have a voice tone that is not seemed as societal appropriate. You may dress a certain way, all of these different dynamics that can come into play, unfortunately, that is tied to your identity that may be used against you. And so we have to be really thoughtful in our services about not being judgmental, being understanding and being open and aware that a person's identity, whether they can take it away or not, whether they can be out with it or not is something that is a part of them. And our services have to respect that. It has to understand that and has to care for that. And we also have to understand that um, if our services are not tailored and the workforce that we have do not look like the populations we serve or understand the populations we serve, people are gonna be a lot less likely to utilize those services. Oh my goodness, we have so much that we need to dig in there and it is 1230. And so I am so sorry that I am gonna to have to end this, but we are gonna pop up a poll. And in that poll, one of the questions is gonna be, would you as attendees like us to do more on this topic? So if you would, <laughs> I would please encourage you 
uh, to, to stick around and provide some the answers in that poll. Um, would really appreciate your feedback. We shape these discussions based on the questions that come in. Uh, we weren't able to get through all of the questions today because it was just, there were some really good things that we wanted to make sure that we covered. Um, and so just thank you to everybody who sent in questions. Thank you to everybody who tuned in today. Um, please do do this poll if you're joining us on Zoom. Um, this chat will go live on our Facebook and our YouTube. So please feel free to share that link with anybody who might have missed it that you think would benefit from watching this chat. And we will be back next month. And so thank you again to our speakers for joining us and for a fantastic conversation that I have a feeling may just be part one of digging into this topic. Thank you, everyone.